Welcome to my lecture online. Now let's talk about planetary nebulas. Just like I have favorite galaxies, I have favorite nebulas, and the planetary nebulas are far at the top of the list. They're absolutely gorgeous to look at. The pictures, as you can see here, are just absolutely incredible. These are just four of the many beautiful planetary nebulas that we have within view of our own solar system. There's probably about a little over a thousand that we have discovered, that we have photographed, and unfortunately, many of them are still out there that we can't see because they're obscured by all the dust and gas that's between us and them. Unfortunately, but at least we get to see over a thousand of them. And here are four of the more famous ones. This one right here is called the Blinking Eye Nebula. This one here is called the Spirograph Nebula because the, it looks just like it was made on the Spirograph, a game that Nowadays, kids don't play so much anymore, but back in my young days, Spirograph was a very fun game where you made these things that look just like that. So that's where the name came from. Here we have the Ring Nebula for obvious reasons. The Ring Nebula is one of my favorite because of the beautiful colors. And then we have the Dumbbell Nebula there as well. So those are four of the more famous planetary nebulas. There's many others. They're also known as NGC 6826 or IC418 or M57 and M27. Notice all of them are relatively close, if you can call 2,000 light years, relatively close for most things in our galaxy. Notice since a galaxy is 100,000 light years across, whenever we talk about something being only 2,000 light years away or less, well, that is very, very close. And that's why we're able to see them and photograph them. They are by and large, of course, the smallest of all the nebulas because they're the result of a dying star, not, as the name would indicate, the starting of a solar or solar system formation. The reason why they call them planetary nebulas is because back in the days when they first were being discovered, and as you can tell, Messier numbered some of them in, in his catalog, uh, you can see that it kind of looked like it was a solar system in the making. At the center, it looked like it was the forming star, the forming sun, and around it, it, was, it looked like a disk of material that would eventually turn into a system of planets, and hence they called it a planetary nebula. Now we simply know that it's the result of a dying star, it's the result of the end stage of a, of a large um, a red giant, and as red giants be become unstable, begin to pulsate, like are our Lyra variables or Cepheid variables, eventually the outer layers get pushed off away from the star, and what's remaining at the very center is the collapsed core of a star that then collapses down into a white dwarf. You can clearly see that right here in this picture. You can also clearly see the core right here. There's a faint result of the core. You can see, therefore, that the that the nebula has grown in size much greater than these two because the relative size of the core is much smaller here in the picture than here and it turns out all the cores end up being about the same size the white dwarfs tend to be about the size of the earth and then here you can barely see the white dwarf emerging from the nebula there as well it is the intense radiation of that very hot surface of that white dwarf as small as it is because it's about the size of the earth that lights up that illuminates and lights up the nebulas around it by ionizing the gas by causing the the photons of the emanation of the of the white dwarf causes the the electrons in the gas to jump up to higher levels and to jump down to lower levels it gives us these beautiful colors and because most stars as they die like that in the outer layers there's other gases besides hydrogen and helium these other gases that also give you the different colors that you see in these beautiful nebulas. So let's look at some of the specifics. As we indicated, the name came from the, the thought that these were solar systems in the making. And of course, that's not at all the case. They're simply the end result of a dying star where the outer layers are slowly moving away from the center, from the core as the core collapses down to a white dwarf and the radiation of the core is then illuminating these layers. These layers, these, these nebulas are only temporary. They only last for several tens of thousands of years. Eventually the layers got to be so far away that the light tends to diminish the, in the ability to light up those layers and eventually the layers begin to fade, fade from view at all and then all you have left is a little white dwarf. Uh, they're found throughout the disk and the inner halo. So not only are they within the disk of the galaxy, they're also in the inner regions of the circular or spherical halo that circumvents our entire galaxy. So even above and below the, the central portion of the disk, you'll find these uh, nebulas. Obviously, there's stars there as well in the inner layers of the, uh, of the halo, and therefore you'll find 
the dying stars that result in these types of nebulas, these, these uh, planetary nebula. So, as I mentioned before, there's over a thousand known planetary nebula. There are probably many more out there, but you simply can't see them because they're obscured by the dust and gas that gets in the way. The lighted up regions are slowly moving away, so if you can take a picture over a period of years, you can then slowly see that that gets bigger and bigger. Some of them we have done so, and you can actually see the, the nebula slowly moving out. The hot core, becoming a white dwarf, is usually visible in these nebulas, and the nebula fades from view after just a few tens of thousands of years. And remember that the white dwarf at the end remains for billions and billions of years. It has a very hot surface. It takes a very long time for the white dwarf to cool down. And so that white dwarf will be there for many, many billions of years. All the white dwarfs that have formed since the beginning of the universe, about 13.5, 13.8 billion years ago, are still out there visible to us as white dwarfs. They haven't faded to the point where they're no longer visible. Obviously, after a long enough period, maybe hundreds of billions of years, they've all cooled down to the point where they're no longer visible as white dwarfs. But that's not yet the case for all the white dwarfs out there. And that is the result of the, pla the planetary nebulas, which are just simply the remnants of dying stars. You said they were in the halo also? Or the yeah, so if you take a look at the galaxy, so we have a galaxy that typically looks like this, this is the cross section of our galaxy. And then we have what we'd call the spherical region, the halo around it. So you'd see, obviously, there's stars in these regions as well. And so in the, the nearby regions outside the main portion of the disk, you will find some of these there as well. Since we're like right here, we're usually typically only talking about seeing something in about that region right there. So these are the ones in that region? Yes, they're all very close. They're only... 2,200 light years, 2,000 light years, 1,200 light years away from us. If this is 100,000 light years, actually, I, I exaggerated this, right? So we're only talking about a very, very small region in, in our galaxy where we're looking around us and looking for these, for these nebulas. So they move around just like um, the Gauss or something? Global. <laughs> well, do they move around like clusters? The answer is... To some extent, yes, but not like the global cluster. The global clusters are everywhere. These are simply dying stars. Now, dying stars, just like non-dying stars, move. So every star has some speed relative to the other stars, but they're relatively small speed. So stars are moving away from us. They're moving towards us. They're moving across from us. So stars are always moving. And yes, so these are moving because they're simply dying stars but not moving at the point where they just move out of sight. They're not moving that fast. So they're moving a lot slower than the global clusters? They would be moving slower than the global clusters, yeah. yeah. And they're by themselves? And they're all by themselves. They're singular stars by themselves. Do they have planets around them? Some of them, presumably. Most, probably most of them probably have stars around them. I mean, I mean planets. planets around them, not stars, but planets around them, yes. No, don't no, don't think of them as they're just roaming through the galaxy. They're just like every other star, and all stars are bound within their own region of the galaxy. They don't move over billions and billions of years other than just small amounts. We're talking about speeds of 10, 20, 30, 40 kilometers per second, and our universe our galaxy being that large, at that speed, it would take you almost forever to go across the galaxy. So they're all bound within their own particular region. They're not gonna just move out of sight, they're gonna pretty well stay there. But they don't move with the galaxy, because the galaxy is moving through space. Yes, they're moving with, yeah, they're all part of the galaxy, just like all the stars. Now, think about it this way. At 30 kilometers per second, which is the speed of the Earth around the sun, so that would be a typical speed of a star moving within our galaxy, to travel one light year would take you tens of thousands of years. No, I'm just wondering if they're just, So are they affected by the galaxy as a group just in the very same way as other stars? So when some of these stars are nearby a heavy concentration of stars, they will be pulled towards that heavy concentration of stars, just like any star would at any time. 
Um, but typically, stars, even though the whole galaxy moves seemingly as a unit and revolves around its axis seemingly as a unit, individually the stars are all kind of moving in their own separate directions. So they're all kind of moving a little bit, and, but relative to where they are, remember, the closest star to us is four, four and a half light years. And if it takes a star tens of thousands of years to travel one light year, you can see that relative to one another, they don't do a lot of moving. If you were to come back a million years from now or 10 million years from now, yes, the local region would look a little bit different. So the constellations would look a little bit different and everything would look a little bit different because stars are indeed moving. But in our lifetimes, we simply don't see them move relative to one another. We can only measure their movement because of the, the Doppler effect, the Doppler shift of the light. So it's all about us? No, it's not all about us. It's, <laughs> it's uh, just what we observe in a lifetime, so to speak. Which yeah. is, it's us. <laughs> it's a drop in the bucket in time. Oh, that's a good question. So that is something that was actually answered just very, very recently. It turned out that the team of astronomers had a brilliant idea. So what they did was they started taking pictures of the space between galaxies. And let me, uh, let me back off a little bit. So, so they, were, they took pictures of the uh, space between galaxies, and then they, they uh, developed the film essentially, uh, unless they were taken on digital and digital uh, cameras. And then they superimposed the picture on itself like a thousand times. So that would then make whatever was there so dim that it could not be seen by a single exposure. They essentially multiplied the exposure like a thousand fold. And by doing that, they actually began to realize that there's a lot of material in between the galaxies. And now they begin to realize there may be as much material in between the galaxies as inside the galaxies themselves. And some of that material may have been dense enough to form stars. So assuming that, as we begin to discover more there, that there potentially are stars in between the galaxies as well, but so far apart that you can essentially not see them unless they're very, very bright stars. But not enough to make up for dark matter. Not yet. So there is a good question. So once they discovered that, which is a recent discovery, only about a year ago or so, that essentially doubled the amount of the visible matter that we realized was in the universe before. So when those discoveries come, they begin to change our picture, our understanding of the universe quite drastically. So all of a sudden, out of nowhere, when a group of very smart astronomers got together and hey, let's do that, and before we knew it, we have twice as much matter in the universe, visible matter, than we had realized before. So who knows? If they continue to discover more at some point, that there may not be a need for dark matter. We may have found all of the visible matter that explains the matter that's there in the first place. Again, we don't know that yet at this point, but you never know. We'll have to see. Only time will tell.